Good day, brothers and sisters. It's Sunday once again. And for those of you who are here in Cebu City or Metro Cebu, I just like to inform you that we are back with our in-person gathering. And so if you decide to join us physically, uh, you can join us in our main church in Banawa in uh, Good Shepherd Road. And so we invite you. We have a Saturday service, which is done in Cebuano. And this is at 9 o'clock in the morning. We have an English service at 9 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. And then also 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And so again, let me just invite you, for those of you who are in Metro Cebu, please join us. I think it is so much better to see each other face to face. But then for those of you outside of Cebu, uh, welcome once again. It's our Sunday virtual service. And uh, I'd just like to share to you from the book of Lamentations. Now, the book of Lamentations is a very sad book. In fact, uh, the one who wrote it, Jeremiah, happens to be a weeping prophet. And why was he weeping? Well, he wept because of the sufferings and oppression of his people under the Babylonians. They were invaded by the Babylonians. Uh, the temple was destroyed, and some of them were brought into exile. And from that time on, uh, they were under the domination of this uh, Middle Eastern empire. And they suffered a lot. There was famine. There was poverty. In fact, it happened that uh, because they had no more, nothing more to eat, the mothers, the compassionate women, so to speak, began to eat the flesh of their own children. The people resorted to cannibalism. And many of their women were raped during the time of war. And the old were not shown mercy. And so... In this backdrop, obviously, you would then ask the question, is there really a God? Does he really care? And the truth of the matter is, the Lord was never at fault with his people. The Lord was never at fault with the nation of Israel. It was the nation of Israel who had been unfaithful to the Lord. It was the nation of Israel that apostatized and began to worship idols and they exercised religious syncretism. They began to add other gods to Yahweh. And the result of that was the wrath of God came upon them. First was the Assyrian exile and following was the Babylonian exile. Jeremiah saw all his prophecies come to pass. He saw the sufferings of his people. But then the Lord reminded him, of his compassion the lord reminded him of his covenant keeping love and this is shown in the book of lamentations in chapter 3 it says in verse 22 the lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease for his compassions never fail they are new every morning great is your faithfulness the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Now, you might be just like the people of Israel. Maybe you have backslidden. Maybe you have uh, slowly drifted away from the Lord. Maybe you have shown so much unfaithfulness in your life and probably you are at the point wherein you are suffering the consequences of your sin i'm here to encourage you that the mercies of god are new every morning and that his loving kindnesses never cease that is our hope and that is the the thing that makes us stand back up after we have fallen and friends, there is always hope in Jesus Christ. And that is why we have this eternal gratitude towards our God. And I hope that somehow you have been encouraged by 
this passage because it is indeed very encouraging, most especially for those of us who have failed the Lord. Let us rejoice in the mercies of God. Let us bask in His presence and let us worship the Lord. Let me invite you to rise from your seats and let's worship the Lord at this time.
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Our sermon can also be heard over DYFR FM 98.7 every Saturday and Sunday at 8 p.m. Great news, brothers and sisters. We will resume our weekend in-person services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. Register now at www.livingword.ph forward slash in dash person dash service. Good news, brothers and sisters. Enough is enough is making a comeback in our church right now. And we are selling it again at 275 pesos here in our church. And you can get a copy right now and share it among your friends. International Bible Institute would like to make an announcement. IBI is still accepting enrollees for the following online courses. OT101, The Pentateuch. OT102, Early Israelite History. PE304, Personal Evangelism. CH305, Church History. HOM306, Sermon Preparation and Delivery. For more inquiries, you may contact 0917-771-6297 or 0922-864-7222 or email us at ibi.livingwordcm at yahoo.com or visit us at Facebook, International Bible Institute, Cebu Extension. Great news! IBI has a new charter in Palawan. You may get in touch with the IBI Palawan Charter at this address. 256 Abad Santos Extension, Bancao Bancao, Puerto Princesa City, Palawan. Or you may call 0920-853-7116 or 0909-300-8863 for more information. We have great news. We are happy to announce that we now have our very own Living Word online bookstore. Your favorite Living Word discipleship materials are now available for download straight to your devices. For a very minimal fee of 100 pesos only, you can now avail of the electronic copies in PDF format. Our Ephesians Volume 1 and Volume 2 are ready for your download. The Journey series, Knowing Christ, is now available online as well. And likewise, we have free study materials like More Than Enough Study Guide, Enough is Enough Study Guide. To avail and for more details, please visit books.livingword.ph. Stay tuned as we make more of our discipleship materials available on our online bookstore. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-000006-0800. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234811. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 
0-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-9-
While it is true that the signs and wonders were intended to prove who Jesus was, the Messiah, we have to understand that when Jesus performed those miracles, it was out of a heart of compassion. And that is why if that is still true today, then we can expect that Jesus would still perform miracles, that he would still perform healing, that he would still cast out demons. Now, of course, we know that there is a slight difference in that dispensation and our dispensation. Because in so far as we believers are concerned, we're not out to prove anything. But we know that at that time, Jesus had to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he indeed was the Messiah. And that is why in our day, in our time, while it is true that Jesus might perform miracles, signs and wonders, and even healing, we have to understand that we now belong to a different dispensation. Jesus had long proven that he indeed is the promised Davidic King and Messiah. And so Jesus has nothing to prove in our day and our time. So my point simply is that when Jesus performs a miracle, it comes from a heart of compassion, a heart that desires to show that he loves and cares for us. Now, having said that, of course, we have to understand that God and Jesus Christ will not, you know, heal every person who happens to be sick. Because sometimes his purposes might be higher than mere physical healing. At other times, he wants to glorify himself, not through an external display of power, but through the inner strength that believers are able to display. Somehow, it becomes an evidence of the presence of the Spirit of God who grants strength and power in our lives. Now, again, the focus of this particular sermon would be the compassion of Jesus. So allow me to give you a three-point outline, very simple and easy to remember. First up, in verse 35, we will see what Jesus did in his compassion. In verses 36 to 37, we will see what Jesus saw in his compassion. And finally, in verse 38, what Jesus asks in his compassion. So let's dive in to our study and let's begin with what Jesus did in his compassion in verse 35. Let us read this passage. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now, in this one verse, we find the short summary of the Galilean ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about the northern part of Israel. And somehow this tells us the activities that Jesus performed in all those places. And we are told in this particular passage that Jesus went through all the cities and villages. Now, I'd like you to take note of that. He did not just go through some cities or some villages, but rather he went through all cities and all villages. And that tells us something about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so allow me to give you a little background about the cities and villages that Jesus uh, visited. And so here's a little background. We learn from the Jewish historian Josephus that at this time there were some 200 cities and villages in the region of Galilee an area of about 40 miles wide and 70 miles long. And this is what one historian said. The cities are numerous and the multitude of villages everywhere are crowded with men 
owing to the fertility of the soil, so that the smallest of them contains about 15,000 inhabitants. And by the way, this is something that I had personally observed in my uh, tours, uh, my educational tours in Israel. When you go to the southern part of the kingdom, a lot of those areas would be desert land. And so there would not be much uh, productivity in those areas. However, the moment you start moving up north, you will notice a lot of vegetation, a lot of crops, a lot of plants. And that tells us basically that the land in the north happens to be very fertile area. And so Josephus, the historian, was quite accurate in saying that it was fertile land. And no wonder that's the reason why a lot of people would inhabit those places because after all, it's highly sustainable. Now let me move further and let me share more descriptions about the place. It contained at least 3 million people. Now if the Bible says that Jesus went through all the villages and all the cities, it is possible that Jesus had direct exposure with practically almost everybody in those regions. And so what we find here is the tireless activity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word going, by the way, is in the Greek imperfect, which speaks of continuous activity. So most probably Jesus must have been the, bus the busiest person in the whole world during this time period. Because as we uh, find in the scriptures, he was going through all the cities and villages. And so what we find with the Lord Jesus Christ is that he grabbed every opportunity because he knew that his time was short. I mean, we're talking about only three years of public ministry. And Jesus was not about to waste his time or, or spend time leisurely. He wanted to grab every opportunity. He wanted to be able to make an impact in the lives of people. And once again, this was coming from a great heart of compassion. He knew the needs of people more than they knew. And that is why Jesus was greatly concerned about them. And that is why no matter how tired his body was, he continued to plod on. He continued to work. He continued to somehow minister to as many people as possible. And I'd like to say that when your heart is full of compassion, you cannot just simply sit down and do nothing. You have to do something. You have to somehow be a solution to the problem. You have to be the answer to the needs of people. And this is exactly what we see in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why we can say that for Jesus, he was not merely concerned about influence or impact. He cared about the individual. He cared about not just crowds, but those crowds had names and faces in so far as Jesus was concerned. In fact, let me just remind you that in the book of Hebrews, we are told that he tasted death for each and every one of us. And that is why, again, we find that the Jesus that you and I are serving happens to be a personal God. He is not impersonal at all. And somehow, we have to look at Jesus as the model, the paradigm by which we are to uh, follow his leading. And I recall one dear lady, who um, I believe was working in a, in a, in a very uh, high-paying job as an executive in Del Monte. And then later on, at the age of 70, she decided that she would do the work of an evangelist, 70 years old. And of course, by that time, she had already retired. 
But you know, she would go to far-flung villages. Uh, she would even ride on top of a jeepney. I mean, I don't mean that she rode inside the jeepney, but on top of the roof of the jeepney. I mean, this is so true in, in places where there are not too many public utility vehicles. And she was busy trying to minister to as many people as possible. And just try to imagine how difficult it is for a woman of 70 years old to do that. What a great sacrifice. But just like Jesus, she had a heart of compassion. It was the Holy Spirit that planted that love in her heart. And therefore, she reached out to as many people as possible. I recall during the early days of my ministry, I was so on fire for God that I would knock on every door, practically ring the bell in every gate because I wanted to invite as many people as possible in my neighborhood to our Bible study. Of course, there were a few who were able to respond and were thankful to God that God did a mighty work. And just like the Lord Jesus Christ, most especially during my early uh, days in ministry, I grabbed every opportunity. In fact, there were two Catholic churches that invited me to preach inside those Catholic church buildings. And they were full packed. And thank God for that privilege, and I was able to minister to people, and I trust that there were many who came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by the grace of God and by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So I'd like to ask you this question. Do you have that sense of urgency? Do you grab every opportunity? Do you have a heart of compassion, just like the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus numbered his days. He knew exactly the time frame by which God would allow him to live. And that is why in our case, we don't know our times. We don't know when God will take us home. But we have to be continually alert, continually desiring to be able to be of use, to be an instrument for the glory of God. And I pray that we will not be wasting time I pray that we will not take our quote-unquote leisurely walk throughout this earthly journey because there are so many people who have needs. There are so many people who need Christ. And most especially during this uh, coming elections, we have to understand that the greatest need of people is not to have new officials as important as that is. What is most important is a national transformation. And that national transformation will not take place unless we believers are willing to preach the gospel, to take the gospel to the very ends of the earth and herald the message that will save lives, that will change lives. And I'd like to challenge you to have the same heart as Jesus had. Now, we are told here that Jesus was teaching in their synagogues. And I'd like to give you another background. What are the synagogues? We have to find out what those are. And so allow me to share to you what the synagogues are. The synagogues developed during the Babylonian exile. And from that time on, they were centers of Jewish community life. The synagogue was a place of worship a town hall, and likewise, a courthouse. Before the exile, all worship centered in the temple at Jerusalem, from which every Jew in Palestine lived less than a hundred miles. But when they were separated from the temple for those 70 years of captivity, they began to gather together in a synagogue, which simply means a place of assembly. Wherever at least 10 Jewish men lived, a synagogue could be formed. And many large cities of the ancient world had numerous synagogues. Now, because of the policy called freedom 
of the synagogues. The exposition of the scripture could be given by any qualified man of the congregation, and the privilege was frequently extended to visiting rabbis or dignitaries. And what we find is that both Jesus and Paul took advantage of this privilege, which became instrumental in the spread of the gospel in the first century. So again, um, the synagogue offered an opportunity for Jesus' voice to be heard. And we have to be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit wherever He leads us so that our voice could be heard. You know, when I was in Manila, I recall that uh, God opened doors for me in several offices. Some were government offices and some were private offices. And every opportunity that God gave to me, I used that to full advantage. I recall that I preached in um, companies like Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, Max Fried Chicken, at least uh, some of the members of the family of, of Max Fried Chicken. And then um, I was able to uh, preach likewise or teach in the Department of Tourism, the Department of Agriculture. And then I, I did Bible studies for uh, the mayor of Malabon at that time. And then, um, insofar as the private uh, sector was concerned, I, I got to preach in uh, FNCB. And so, God granted me several opportunities, and wherever those opportunities would lead me, I would use that to preach the gospel. I would preach even to certain neighborhoods. And in those neighborhoods, sometimes I would be teaching only about three or, or five people. But it did not matter. For as long as my voice could be heard by the empowering, of course, of the Holy Spirit and, and the teaching of God's Word. And so, again, let this be a challenge to you. And sometimes uh, we say there are no opportunities, but the problem is maybe we're not looking for opportunities. Maybe we're not praying for God to open doors. And one thing we know about our God, when He opens a door, no man can shut it. And when God shuts a door, no man can open it. So when God opens those doors of opportunities, let us be sensitive enough, let us be caring enough to use those opportunities to be able to share the gospel to people. Now, we are told that Jesus was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Now, the word proclaiming uses the Greek word keruso, which is often translated to preach. The basic meaning is to herald a message or to make a public announcement for everyone to hear. And again, we cannot be hiding under the bed, as the Lord Jesus Christ said. The Bible says that we are the light of the world. And you do not, you do not lamp or you, you do not light a lamp and put it under the bed for its light to be hidden. But rather the light is to be placed on a spot in the house where everybody could somehow enjoy the lighting. And again, lights are not supposed to be hidden. They're supposed to be in a place where people are, a place where your voice could be heard. And again, we can think about a hundred and more areas where you and I could be a blessing to others. And that's why, again, let me encourage you to proclaim the gospel. It doesn't have to be from a pulpit. It doesn't have to be uh, with a group. You can even do it one-on-one. -on -one. The point is, allow yourself to be used by the Lord. Now, what was Jesus preaching? He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And allow me to define to you what the gospel of the kingdom is. The gospel of the kingdom is not just the future kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth and the eternal state, but rather it likewise talks about the present kingdom 
in which you and I can be part of if we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives. And so again, uh, we can be a part of this, this kingdom and likewise the future kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ in the millennium if Jesus is the Lord and Savior of our lives. And this is what we need to be preaching and teaching to people. We need to be telling them that they can have a relationship with Christ, that they can be part of this kingdom. And again, um, it is something that we have to uh, imbibe, something that we have to constantly strive at. Because that is what the Lord wants. We are to be proactive. The Bible says, go and make disciples of all nations. And first of all, we cannot make disciples unless, first of all, we evangelize them. Unless, first of all, we share Jesus to them. And then, when they become believers in Christ, then the responsibility is for us to take care of them, mentor them, and disciple them. Now, let me define further this, this kingdom. The kingdom is the rule and reign of Christ now in and over his saints on earth, eventually over all the earth during the millennium, and ultimately and eternally over the new heavens and the new earth. Anybody can be part of this kingdom, even the worst of sinners, for as long as as they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. Now remember, when the Bible speaks about a kingdom, then there is a king. And if there is a king, there are likewise subjects. And as subjects of this kingdom, we are to observe and obey every rule that is found in the kingdom, rules that are made by the king himself. And again, we have to ask ourselves this question. As we have become part of this kingdom, are we allowing ourselves to be good subjects? Are we allowing ourselves to be obedient to the rules of the kingdom? And this is why we teach not only about the saviorhood of Jesus Christ, but his lordship as well. Jesus is not just the Savior of our lives. He is the Lord of our lives. And if He's not Lord of all, He is not Lord at all. And that is why let us make sure that in every aspect of our lives, Jesus is King. That Jesus is seated on the throne of our hearts. He must be number one. We serve at the pleasure of the king. Now, in this passage, it likewise says that he was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now, this display of supernatural power, which I have mentioned to you uh, previously in our other sermons, were intended to verify that Jesus indeed was the promised Messiah, the Vedic king, and likewise the Savior of the world. But likewise, it was intended to verify that his teaching and preaching were true. Everything that Jesus said was true, and it was backed up by signs and wonders. Let me say this. That is still true up to today. Jesus continues to back up his word with signs, wonders, and miracles, most especially in the areas where the gospel has not been preached as much, like in Africa, like in China, and in many other parts of the world. In fact, even um, in the Middle East, we find that there are some people who receive visions and dreams and even personal appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of these things are intended to show that what has been written in God's Word is true. And, you know, let me just share to you a little story. And I was so blessed with this testimony because there was this lady who gave birth 
to a son. Unfortunately, the son's heart had a huge hole. And so the doctor said to the mother that the child would not survive. And obviously, the husband and the wife, uh, the mother and father were obviously distraught. They were frustrated. They were, they were really in pain because they really wanted this child. All of their other children were, were daughters, and this was the very first son that they were going to have. And so they prayed together before the Lord. And the wife, uh, even as she was mulling over this very critical situation, somehow uh, received an impression from the Lord. And the impression that came into her mind was this, do not worry, everything is going to be all right. And so right after that, she was able to have a sound sleep. And then she woke up in the morning and the doctor was there. And the doctor said, I have good news for you. The hole that your, uh, your son's heart has, the hole has disappeared. And again, what was that? It was an amazing, stupendous miracle. God still does that today to prove to people that He is true, to prove to people that He is still the God of yesterday, today, and forever. Now, let's have a look at what Jesus saw in His compassion. In verses 36 to 37, it says, Seeing the people, He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You know, in this particular passage of scripture, we find a disclosure of the heart of Jesus, his divine compassion. From the vantage point of a hillside, Jesus was looking over at the vast multitude, the mass of people who had become his followers for several months now. And the divine eyes of Jesus saw an infinitely greater need than these people were seeking. Obviously, the people were seeking uh, things that were temporal, healing, uh, provisions, uh, the casting out of demons, and so on and so forth. And that was what they felt was really their need. But Jesus saw beyond that. And while he was willing to minister to the temporal conditions of people, he knew that his primary mission was to save the lost. And he saw these people and he saw their spiritually lost condition. They were hell-bound sinners. And unless they would accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives, they will all end up in hell. And that is what Jesus saw. Over and over in the scriptures, we see the compassion of Jesus Christ. And let me just point out to you a few passages. It says in Matthew 23, Verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Notice the heart of Jesus Christ here. And he is using a, an imagery here, the imagery of a mother hen who would bring her children under her wings. And this normally happens, most especially when those chicks would be under attack, let's just say with an eagle that is hovering above. A mother would do everything to protect her chicks, even at the risk of her own life. 
And, and that tells us so much about the kind of heart that Jesus was. In fact, you and I know that because of the compassion of Jesus Christ, he died. He was crucified. He was nailed to the cross. He died for the sake of removing, cleansing us from our sins. And that is why, friends, again, we cannot question the heart of Jesus we, we only just have to look at the cross, and by looking at the cross, what do we see? We see divine love. We see divine compassion. Now, the Greek word for compassion here is the Greek word splankna, which is only used of the Lord, interestingly. It is not used of anybody else, but it is only used of the Lord. And why not? The Lord's compassion is different from our human compassion. To be sure, yes, we, we do have mercy and we feel pity for people who are uh, probably in extreme poverty. But you know, Jesus' compassion is so much more. So much more. It transcends every kind of compassion. And the noun form of the verb behind felt compassion literally refers to the intestines or bowels. Isn't that quite interesting? Now let me explain. The Hebrews, like many other ancient peoples, expressed attitudes and emotions in terms of physiological symptoms, not in abstractions. As most of us know from personal experience, in any intense emotions, anxiety, fear, pity, remorse, and so on, it can directly and often immediately affect the stomach and the digestive tract. That's why upset stomach, colitis, and ulcers are a few of the common ailments frequently related to emotional trauma. It is not strange then that Ancient people associated strong emotions with that particular part or region of the body. There was great stress in Jesus' life, but not because of personal problems. He had great stress. He was under great duress because of his deep love for mankind. Jesus was stressing for the sake of people. He was stressing because he saw that People had a great need. And that is why we find here that Jesus had so much love for people. Now, let us go and do some word studies because when Jesus looked at them, he said that they were distressed and that they were dispirited. Let's do a little word study and try to find out how Jesus saw them. The word distress is the Greek word skulo, or skulo, which means harassed or severely troubled. It often connoted the ideas of being battered, bruised, mangled, ripped apart, worn out, and exhausted. Jesus saw the multitudes as being inwardly devastated by their sinful and hopeless conditions. That's what Jesus saw. He saw that these people really needed deliverance, that they really needed help. And a lot of the things that they were going through was really as a result of their own sinfulness and their own wretchedness. And they did not even know that. But Jesus saw everything. He saw their minds. He saw their hearts. He saw their pains. He saw their hurts. And above all, he saw their lost condition. Now, it says that they were also dispirited. It comes from the Greek word ripto, which has the basic meaning of being thrown down, prostrate, and utterly helpless, as from drunkenness or a mortal wound. And so these were people who were wounded, people who were broken, people who did not know where to turn to. People who were at their wit's end. And this is what Jesus saw. And by the way, this happens to be in the Greek 
perfect tense in the Greek, which means that this was a lingering situation. It was a continuing situation. And that is why, again, we find here that, that, that Jesus knew their pain. He knew their pain from the very beginning. You know, one of the most uh, wonderful verses of Scripture found in the book of Psalms tells us that He keeps our tears in His bottle. And of course, obviously the psalmist was not talking about a literal bottle, but it tells us that God cares. The Lord has a memory of all our pains and all our hurts. And I'm here to tell you, He cares for us. He loves you. Now, we are told here that they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, of course, there were Pharisees. There was the Sanhedrin. There were the priests, the high priests, and, and the Levites. And there were the scribes. But truth to tell, they were not true shepherds. And so Jesus saw these people as sheep without a shepherd. They had nobody to protect or take care of them. Now, excuse me for saying this, but the Lord uses the imagery of sheep. And sheep are the most stupid of all animals. They are defenseless, helpless, and they are spiritually battered. And, and, and that's how Jesus saw the people at that time. They, Jesus saw them as, quote-unquote, stupid, defenseless, spiritually battered, obviously needing all the help in the world. Sadly, the religious leaders, the spiritual leaders of that time, were likewise spiritually blind. And how could the spiritually blind lead others who are likewise blind? Instead of shepherding the people, they, they brought confusion and they brought hopelessness. The Pharisees, in fact, added burdens to so many of these people with all their oral traditions, with all the human traditions and commandments that they had come up with. Life became even more difficult, spiritually speaking, for these people. And oftentimes, these shepherds even exploited them. And by the way, that's the reason why the, the, the priests, the high priest and, and many other priests were very wealthy. And they were wealthy at the expense of the poor people. You know, there is a similarity between the shepherds during the time of Jesus and the shepherds during the time of Ezekiel as well as of Jeremiah. And I just like to quote to you some passages. Uh, in Ezekiel 34, verses 2 to 4, it says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The deceased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity you have dominated them. Now that was true during the time of Ezekiel, and that remained to be true during the time of Jesus Christ. In the book of Zechariah, it says, Those who buy, buy them slay them and go unpunished. And each of those who sell them says, Blessed be the Lord, for I have become rich, and their own shepherds have no pity on them. And so, Jesus, being the good shepherd, saw all of this, and he wanted to somehow minister and care for his flock, to reach out to the lost so that they might come to a saving knowledge of himself. Now, what does Jesus ask in his compassion in verse 38? It says in verse 38, Therefore, beseech 
the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers into his harvest. The word harvest here indicates that there was a readiness to now respond to the gospel. And by the way, we have to understand Jesus and, of course, the Blessed Trinity, they are the Lord of the harvest. The Blessed Trinity is the Lord of the harvest. And having said that, you and I know that it is God who grants the harvest. And the Lord needs reapers who will reap that harvest. And, you know, one of the things that has blessed my heart with my wife, Marie, is that she always has a heart to share the gospel. And I recall one time when she was on a plane and we got separated because we probably um, registered late. And so she was seated on the other aisle and I was seated on the other aisle. And there was a woman who was seated together uh, with my wife. And so my wife saw it as an opening to share the gospel. And she began to share about the love of Christ. She began to share about salvation. And all throughout that time, this lady that she was with was, was tearing up. And somehow she felt the unconditional, special love that Jesus had for her. And she was very much touched. My wife shared verses of scripture and, and she noted it down on her cell phone, intending that after that trip, she would open her Bible because she said, I've never read my Bible. It was, I was given a gift of a scripture during my wedding, but I never opened it. And now I am going to study it. And so what a wonderful opportunity. The Lord is the one who opens the hearts of people. He is the Lord of the harvest. The harvest belongs to Him. And the question is, are you willing to be a partner in that harvest? Are you willing to be the reaper? The first need in so far as Jesus is concerned here is, is for workers. Until that point, uh, the disciples that were following Jesus Christ were merely uh, learners and they were merely onlookers. All they did was observe and learn and watch Jesus. But now, the Lord wanted something more from them. All ministry at that point was still done by Jesus. Now Jesus shows the reason and need why he needed to involve all of his disciples. And again, that is true of us as well. There is a need for us to become involved. There is a need on our part to become engaged in the work of the Lord. The solution to the dilemma that Jesus is presenting to us here is prayer. It says here, Beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So the solution is prayer. And this happens to be in the aorist imperative. And Jesus was really telling them, you need to pray immediately. The harvest is here ready. Pray to God. And we have to understand, as we pray, we should be willing to be called as well by God. Remember um, what happened in the case of Isaiah? And the Lord presented to him the spiritual need of the people of Israel. What did Isaiah say? He did not say, here am I, send them, but rather, here am I, send me. And that is why, as Kent observes, as so often occurs, those who prayed were themselves sent. Those who pray were themselves sent. Most definitely, that was true in the case of the disciples. And hopefully, that would likewise be true in your case as you pray to the Lord and seek His face. Now, when we look at the whole study that we made today, 
we saw Jesus' compassion in action. And in the end of this, he is telling us, he was telling his disciples to join in in the action. And you know what? You will join in in the action if you have the same heart as Jesus, a shepherd's heart, a heart of compassion. And that is my prayer for you. Let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. And thank you for revealing, disclosing to us the very heart of Jesus. And we pray that we might have the same heart as him. Lord, we thank you for today. And thank you for the opportunity to share uh, our resources, to participate in the work of the Lord. Whatever has been achieved today, we give you back the glory, praises, and thanks. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. It's been a wonderful weekend, brothers and sisters. So I hope that you can join us in our next few uh, sermons. Um, if you have not yet liked our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, please do so. Hit the notification bell. And also, please check out our website, www.livingword.ph. And don't forget to like and share these videos so that we can spread the word and herald the gospel. God bless you all. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Our sermon can also be heard over DYFR FM 98.7 every Saturday and Sunday at 8 p.m. We will resume our weekend in-person services every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. Register now at www.livingword.ph forward slash in dash person dash service. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 0010000060. Zero, zero. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234811. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount, enter the name LWCCCII, and account number 001. 00006080800 and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph then click send money you may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website go to www.livingword.ph and click give and then a dialog box 
comes out of it, kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.